Micro Nano Education for Everyone. Trinity, some of you know Trinity from last year. She was a Mint Kern participant, and she is an experienced Python coder and tutor with three years of experience teaching code to students of all backgrounds from elementary through college. And as I mentioned, I took one of her trainings um, during Pi Day at Pasadena City College last year, and she did an amazing job with that. She's also worked professionally as a software engineer intern at JPL, Jet Propulsion Lab, and Caltech L3 Harris, um, L3 Harris Technologies and has done other freelance work. And now she's a junior at UC Berkeley studying computer science. She just transferred um, last year or at the beginning of you know, this, this fall. And she's involved with Berkeley's Open Computing Facility and Berkeley Laboratory for Usable Experimental Security, or BLUES. So Trinity, I'm gonna hand the meeting over to you. Thank you so much for doing this workshop for us. Yeah, thank you, Tanya. So um, this workshop is meant to be, you know, for people who are interested in learning about Python. Um, but first I'm gonna kind of start with an overview with um, computers because since Python is a language that in which we're talking to computers, we should first understand what a computer really does. So, I mean, very simply breaking it down, a computer is a thing that computes. So anything from your calculator to whatever, it has an input. It processes that input somehow, and we get an output. In order to process that output, it also needs to have some sort of memory to keep track of all the values that are involved within the calculation. So real quick, um, we probably have heard a lot of these words before. Um, so um, we'll, we're very familiar how we interact with the computer, which is we usually have a keyboard, a mouse, and a screen. Um, so those we call peripherals. And within the computer, we usually have something called a hard drive, or these days we have um, SSDs. Um, so that's storing kind of your files, um, like long-term storage. We have now something called a RAM, which stands for Random Access Memory. And um, that's kind of the short-term memory that is being used during um, intense calculations. Um, and again, I don't expect you to remember all this, but just to be aware of the things that are going on inside the computer when when you are interacting with it. Um, people who have played like video games before or um, maybe do some like really com computationally intensive work, such as like animation or like, you know, um, dealing with like very detailed images um, are probably familiar with um, like their RAM. Um, it affects performance significantly if you're like, you know, running something that is very intensive. Um, so that is like the short-term memory. And this is, you know, what is being used when we are coding and like setting variables and so on, which we'll talk about soon. Next, you have the CPU, which really is the brains of the whole computer. It's the, um, it is the one that are actually causing the computation and the logic. We also have the graphics card called the GPU. Um, the GPU computes very simple operations meant for graphics um, in order to like display on the screen. And there's um, you know, heat sink, like sometimes if you're doing something really intensive on your computer, you know it heats up. Modem router, that's like you know internet stuff, which we won't worry about. The main things we'll be thinking about is the fact that we have some kind of limited memory in our computer and some, you know, the brains, the computing power. All right. And within this machine, we have, so we have just looked at the hardware, you know, that's like the physical component. And then we have the software, which is, you know, the logical components that are written um, in code on top of the hardware in order to interact with it. So I hope everyone is on a computer right now. So, um, we refer to the operating system, which is either Windows, Mac OS, or, um, or Linux. 
And the operating system is the core of how um, you know, we are able to run the computer. The operating system runs all like the very important base stuff like um, you know, file man- your file management, like you know, your desktop, like how you get to s- uh, see that. Um, and it also runs other software. You might notice that like for certain um, applications, like you have to download your operating system s- specific one. Like there's might be Windows specific app, Mac OS specific app, and so on. Because yes, the the software itself and the machine itself to to some extent is uh, fundamentally different. Um, so it has you know you have to have different kind of software in order to interact with um, the core operating software. And remember, you don't have to remember all the details. This is just kind of an overview so you're, you're aware. Okay, so now let's go on to Python itself. So first of all, what is a programming language? Well, a language is for you know, two parties to communicate with each other. So it's language like English is for people to talk to people. Python is for you to talk to the computer. Now, just like any other like language that we think about, a language has its own kind of, I would say, like culture or like philosophies. Um, also has its own grammar. Um, it has its own limitations and advantages as well. Like a language like, um, for example, a language like English is like, you know, used very widely around the world, but of course everyone knows it's uh, not an easy language to learn. Um, and in some languages, like, you know, like some words, of some like there exists some vocabulary which um, isn't present in other languages and so on. So you'll find that all kinds of different programming languages sort of have these same quirks. Um, also the fact that it takes time to learn a programming language. So uh, this workshop is two hours and I hope that you feel more confident with Python afterwards, but realize that um, being comfortable with programming Will will take time, just like you know, speaking another language fluently will take take lots of time. So just to set your expectations there, and everyone goes at different paces too. You'll definitely find that learning one language will help you learn others. Okay, and so Python itself is going to be a high level language. You also have languages at the other levels. Machine language being the, we call it from low to high. So low meaning it's really close to the, the, the hardware, the machine itself. And then high meaning it's more like, more like human language. So for example, if we looked at these ones and zeros, this is impossible to read. <laughs> um, looking at the assembly language. So you notice how um, we start at the high level language and it actually turns it into um, it actually like translated into the lower level language so that eventually it turns into machine language or bytecode and um, the computer is able to understand that. Yeah, luckily we don't have to write zeros and ones. <laughs> and so just again, overview with how Python is actually working. It takes our source code. So that's, you know, our Python language and it's trans- it has to go through a couple of steps to translate it into something that the, the computer can actually execute. So here's kind of the, the language quirks of Python. I would say Python right now is the most widely used programming language just because of how versatile it is. Um, people use Python for data analysis, web apps, machine learning, system administration, and much, much more. Um, Like at my internships, I think I've pretty much always used Python. Um, Again, just because of how flexible and um, easy, it's it's a very productive language, I would say, because um, it takes less code in order to be able to accomplish what you want to accomplish. So um, it's open source, it's interpreted, um, open source means that it's actually community based. So there's a Python community, like it's a it's an organization, and also just like community members can just like um, propose 
different changes to Python. And, you know, if that gets a lot of votes, like it'll be actually included in the next update. So that that's very nice. Um, interpreted also is, um, so there's interpreted language and there's compiled languages. Um, if any of you have taken like a C++ course before, or Java course, you'll know that um, before you have to run, before you run your code, you have to compile it. And then you can then run the, the, compi the compiled version because that's now the executable. So that's kind of the thing between tr first translating it um, from the source code into like a more machine read readable version. For Python, interpreted means that it'll actually do that on the fly. So it doesn't have to look at the whole document before it runs the code. It can run the code as it's reading it. So we'll see how, um, we'll see that as, um, you know, once we actually start writing code. Um, Python is also recommended a lot as a first language just because as code readability, it's, uh, it's nice, it's easier to read. It doesn't have a bunch of like curly braces and brackets that you have to follow along. Um, because we use uh, indentation instead. Okay, finally, um, the dynamically typed means that Python is less strict and it gives you a lot more flexibility. So for languages such as the two I mentioned earlier, Java and C++, they um, enforce a lot more rules. So for example, when you create a variable, they want you to specify exactly what type it is. Um, in the case of Python, we're able to, um, Python is able to infer um, what data type we're using and so that we don't have to worry about that as much. And um, garbage collected, this has to do with memory. So if you stop using, um, if you stop using a variable, then Python is going to know to um, collect the gar garbage. And so like, since you're not using it, you know, it's not useful, it's garbage. So it'll, it'll clean that up for you. In languages like C++, you get a lot more control over memory, which is why people use um, C++ for like, where it's very, very important to like optimize the program as much as possible. But for our use cases, you know, um, Python's garbage collection system is quite good. All right, now knowing those things, it, of course, I don't expect you to remember all of that, but it's just a nice overview and understanding the differences. Um, let's start writing code. Okay, all right, so make sure you uh, log in. Once you're logged in, it'll say the words logged in at the top of your screen. And then we are going to go to our dashboard. So, as I showed in the diagrams earlier, Python is a kind of software, like Python itself is software that we're able to run our, on our machine. Now, for us to be able to, I guess, interact with Python more nicely, and also since everyone is on a different kind of machine, so there's you know people that are on Macs right now or on Windows, maybe even Linux, um, also, to, so that we don't have to worry about those differences, um, we're using this NanoHub platform. You also find that it's very nice. Um, you know, th there's a lot of tools within NanoHub that you can explore. Um, essentially, what it's doing is that we're connecting to another machine that is not, not your machine, but, you know, somewhere out there in the so-called cloud, right? So out there... Somewhere out there, there's a computer that you are connecting to. That computer is running the Python code. Um, and it's just nice because, um, you know, because we're all using the NanoHub platform, it'll be more uniform. And, um, well, if you if you're, don't have a very good computer, for example, you know, the, the connection with the other computer like that will be a load off of your computer as well. For those who are already on the dashboard page, if you scroll down, you'll find a little area that says My Tools. Under the All Tools, you can search. Yeah. I'm sorry to jump in again. Mm -hmm. It's possible that if it's the first time, you might not have the My Tools module installed yet. 
Mm-hmm. And so if you scroll up to the top of the this area, the top of your dashboard on the right where it says add modules, there's a little blue gray button. And then you can select the, the My Tools module. And then you'll see what Trinity has. No, oh, okay. And then I think you want to just open the most uh, recent version of Jupyter Notebook, which I believe is this one. All right, and from here you can click Launch Tool. Once you are here, um, you might not see the same files as me here. Do not worry. Um, everyone has their own um, private like file directory for you know your account. And if you have done any projects with Jupyter Notebook in the past, um, through Nanohub, you might see them here as well. Um, this screen that you see, it really will, but it's quite literally like a file directory. So you know, if you're on Mac, you might be familiar with the Finder app. If you're on Windows, uh, File Explorer. This is, is essentially the same thing, but like a, a web browser. And it's looking at the files that are not on your machine, but that machine that we're connected to for this um, NanoHub Jupyter Notebook instance. So Jupyter Notebook is an environment a little different from just directly interacting with our computer because we can um, it's Jupyter Notebook is called a interactive environment because we can run code alongside um, having text. So let's create a new notebook. Um, so on the top right, I'm going to make this a little bigger so you can see. Looking at the top right, there's a new box. Let's click on, there's multiple different options. Let's just choose Python 3.8 without any special option. It opens up a new Jupyter Notebook file. And we have an empty cell in which we can write code in. Already go a couple of minutes. I just want to show um, that again, this Jupyter notebook environment through NanoHub is very different from interacting with Python on your own machine. Um, okay, so this is called a terminal. So a terminal is, or also called a command line, is um, a text based interface where you can interact with your computer using various commands. Um, so I can call the Python 3 application and it opens up a Python 3 environment. And I can type in Python code here. And whatever I do here, again, it's running directly on my machine. Now this, this um, text-based environment isn't as like user-friendly because um, you know, I can't, if I like click on my mouse anywhere, like it, it doesn't do anything, right? Um, it's only purely through text. So you know, I type in whatever commands, um, if I want to exit out of this, uh, out of Python, I would have to type in exit and so on. So again, since um, we want to just focus on the Python part and that we are modern people who use modern technology. Um, we're using Jupyter Notebook. It's a nicer and learning environment. Okay, so we're gonna start with just a couple of Python basics. First of all, in Python, um, you're interacting with the computer and computers are very good at calculating things. So let's try testing Python's math skills. Um, you can press, um, any kind of calculation you can use. There's plus, um, multiplication will be with the asterisk sign. 
sum of pars minus and divide. If we, um, you can now run this code by clicking the run button and it'll give me an answer. Notice how Python actually preserved the order of operations. Um, if we were, um, let's see, so five times two, that's 10, then division. So 30 divided by 10 is two. And then it did 12 plus 10 minus two. Oh, sorry, minus three, which gave us 19. I'm going to write a little note here. You can write comments in Python by putting a uh, this hashtag symbol, pound symbol in front of the line, in front of your um, code. I'm just going to write a little note here. And I'm going to write a little note here, just saying that a reminder that Python follows the order of operations. All right. You'll also notice that in this Jupyter Notebook environment that we have something called cells. One cell is going to be one, um, one gray box. So you see I have three gray code boxes here. The first one just containing a, a comment, second one containing my calculations, the third one here is um, empty. And um, in Jupyter Notebook, you can run these cells, um, these like mini chunks of code individually, even like out of order. So it's very interactive. You know, you can just only run the section of the code that you want to run. Also with cells, um, in the little output box, we'll show you the result of having run your code. Python always shows the last thing it evaluated. In this case, the last thing it evaluated in this box was this um, mathematical expression, which is why it shows as 19. Okay, so we can do more than um, just numbers in Python. We can also interact with text. So text is always put inside of either single quotes or double quotes. You also notice how it colors it differently. So I guess inside of Jupyter Notebooks, um, numbers are green. The little um, math operations are purple and like the strings are this um, dark red or brown color. That coloring is, um, it's, not, it's not part of Python, but it's just part of, you know, this um, coding environment, you know, Jupyter Notebook to help us follow along and see our code better. If everything was black, you know, it, it gets harder to read, especially if you have a lot of code. Okay, going back, so this is um, text, also called strings, because they're a uh, sequence of characters. is surrounded in quotes. So either single quotes or double quotes. So we can say hello. This is, um, yes, this is a string that says hello. 
String can contain more than just um, alphabetical, right? It can contain numbers, it can contain special characters, and so on. Oh, also, I think I forgot to mention that if you want to create a new cell, it's nice to keep organized by um, separating our parts of our code into different cells. Um, you can press this plus button and it'll create a new um, cell. All right, with strings, we can also do operations with strings. So we can do um, hello plus another string. And it's just going to mush them together into one string. Now, it doesn't really make sense to do like a minus. Right. Notice how um, notice how we get this uh, big, this scary looking red X. It says uh, type error. And Python is another reason why Python is very nice is because it'll it'll show you um, where it ran into the error and what kind of error it is. So it says unsupported op brand for minus for the values um, string and string. Yeah, so there's no um, minus operations that we can do with strings. We can do um, multiplication, which seems a little weird, but if I do hello times five, it'll say hello five times. Notice how it also, um, I have this space inside of my string. If I were to remove that space, of course, all the words will be stuck together without a space. So with the spaces, type you have to remember this is this is like you know typing you know, typing stuff into a calculator. You know this is um, Python is a machine. You're talking you're talking to a machine. So it, it's like it's like talking to a baby who happens to be really really good at math. Like you have to be extremely literal in terms of what you wanted to do um, because the machine can't read our minds. Right. If we're talking to another person, like even if we maybe like slip up, you know, we mispronounce something or, um, you know, we switch up our words, like usually the other person can understand. Now, Python isn't like that, which is why you might even find it frustrating at times because like you have this idea of what you want to do, but it seems like Python just can't understand. For that, you have to be extremely aware of um, what you're typing and how the computer is interpreting what you're typing. Because again, Python will take everything you write extremely literally. If you do run into any error, like um, for example, like let's say I, I forgot to put my um, quote at the end of my um, string, you will get an error that again looks something like this. Do not be scared, right? Error does not mean the end of the world. Usually it's, you know, not something too bad. Um, here it says syntax error. Syntax is just another word for grammar. So it's saying it's found um, EOL stands for end of line while scanning string literal. It's like, is is essentially complaining that oh you never um like you began the string you began the text and then Python's just waiting so like he's going through and reading until it finds the end of the the string at the end of the text but it never found it so a is interpreting like this uh, space the multiplication symbol and the five is part of our string. So it's um it's complaining. All right, so so far we have numbers. 
we can have operations numbers. So we have strings. We can do operations on string. Um, we call these data types. So, so far we have numbers and strings. Now there are more data types and we'll go through them. We have something called a Boolean. Um, the word Boolean is named after this uh, famous dude called George Bool or something like that. Um, he kind of invented a lot of like computer logic. And the uh, Boolean is just two values, true and false. In Python, we use a capital T for true, capital F for false. And with this, we also have Boolean operators. Yeah. Notice how um, I'm just organizing my code. Um, I'm putting in comments in between my code so that you know I can look back at it and like remember what I was doing. Um, you don't have to type. You never, in this um, workshop, you never have to type exactly what I type. In fact, I encourage you to type in, you know, different things, um, try out different things, see what happens, and also um, write the comments that make sense to you. Because after all, you're the one who's going to be looking back at this, you know, for reference. So just um, write what helps for you. Okay. So, Boolean operators. Mm, so... Statements that are either true or false. So let's say, um, you know, either it's raining outside or it's, um, or it's sunny outside. So if it's either it's raining, so raining is true, or it's sunny outside, sunny is true, then the whole statement will evaluate to true. And for example, if I say, like, are you a human or are you a dog? <laughs> like, obviously, since you are a human, you would say yes. But if I said, are you a human or, or and, um, are you human and you are a dog? Then you would say no, because, like, both of those things are not true. So we have the or operator. And we have the AND operator. So true or false, this evaluates to true since one of the two is true. And at least one of the two is true. And we have false, as at least one of the two is false. You can test that if you run the cell. Again, Python, or sorry, inside of Jupyter Notebook, um, it will always show the last expression evaluated. So um, Python goes through the cell, it reads it line by line looks at the value true, looks at the value false, it evaluates true or false, and then it evaluates true and false. And since that was the last thing, it shows false. If I wanted it to show um, both of these values, I can use the print statement. And that way, um, print will is a function that's part of Python that will print it out to the output. And so if I print both, then it will show both. All right, so we've gone through numbers, strings, and Boolean. 
And I just showed you the print function, which oh, I just said the words. The print is a function, which is um, something that we'll go into in the latter half of the workshop. Right. Oh, Casey has a comment. You want to read that, Trinity? Yeah, this is very similar to coding for an Arduino. Yeah, that's very true. So in different programming languages have its quirks, but in general, you know, you're still talking to a machine. So things like data types. So we went over numbers, strings, booleans. Um, well, later on, we'll also go over logic, like if, else conditions, like those kind of things will all be very similar. That's true. And so learning one language makes it a lot easier to learn another language. All right, so again, we went over um, some different data types and different operations that we can do. And so these are kind of like, you know, the different um, values that we're able to work with inside of Python. And now let's actually do some logic with them. Okay, so again, we went over the data types. These are the values we can work with. And then now let's actually apply some logic to them. First of all, um, you may have heard the word variable before, um, probably in your math classes, you know, like find X, right? This is mysterious, um, unknown value X. Well, in, in uh, programming, we can set our own variables. So a variable is some symbol or word that stands for um, some value. So um, I mean, we could label our values like x um, usually you want to be a little more detailed than that like use the equal sign which is one equal sign will be the um, assignment operator and so we can um, establish that this uh, symbol this word in this case uh, my underscore number is um, now equivalent to the value 25. I can do mathematical operations with this number. I can also um, I can change the number again. And run the same calculation. Of course, it'll be different because now I changed the, I changed my variable. So just write a little note for yourselves here. So, um, creating variable. You always use uh, the variable name, the equal sign and then some value. All right. And now um, you can also, let's see. Um, just like in math, we have our comparison operator. So with numbers, we could do like greater than, um, less than, less than, equal to, and, um, Equal to, since the, since the um, equal sign operator already means something, right? One equal sign is an assignment. It assigns variables to a value. Um, for the comparison operator, like is, are these two values the same? It's gonna be done with two equal signs. And the value of a comparison operator, right, is uh, my number equivalent to the number three? Um, that's like a yes or no question, right? Either the statement is true or false. So we get that Boolean value 
false as a result of this comparison. Remember, we also have, um, as she mentioned, we have greater than, less than. Greater than or equal to. All of these are called the comparison operator. OK, and with this, let's now do some logic. We have something called the if and else statement. So we can do something different depending on our values. So let's say for right now, my number is 10. If, and after the if will come a Boolean value, a statement, or expression that evaluates to either true or false. What's nice is that it almost but not quite reads a little like English. But I could say something like if my number is equivalent to number three, then I will say something. Right now, um, Number is exactly three. And be very careful about the syntax or the grammar. You notice that at the end of the if line, we have a colon. And then after the line with the colon, everything after is indented with four spaces. One, two, three, four. Now the spacing is um, extremely important and important in Python. Like I said, it's part of Python's grammar or syntax. Trinity, mm -hmm. right here, um, can you add one more space before the print and see if that changes the color? Sometimes I wasn't sure if it does in our system. Mm. Um, okay. okay, let's see. If we have less than one, less than four, it does, um, I'm not sure, it, it does not throw an error um, because the standard is to use four, but I think um, what Python actually looks for is it looks for that every line has the same indentation. So in theory, I can have one space, but it's good practice to always have four. If I do different indentation for these two, like I have um, four spaces here and I have only one space here, then it says um, the indent does not match any other indent level. Same with if I had more spaces, it's unexpected indent. It should always be consistent, which is why we stick to four. Great, thanks. That's a good thing to point out. Um, and that was also a little bit of my bad because um, there's a lot of things with Python that we follow as kind of like a guideline for like good programming practices, but that isn't necessarily like enforced by Python. For example, it's usually good like considered good practice in Python to use um, to use variable names to be like all lowercase and then um, separate words using the underscore character. In other language like JavaScript, they use something called a camel case, in which case you just um, use a capital letter for every like new word. But in Python, every like people just agreed like, okay, like this is like a nice um, way to write Python. But Python itself doesn't actually care. So yeah, same with what I with this indent thing it looks like. So um, you can have any level of indent, but you want to stay and make sure the indent level is the same for all of the lines of code in this um, if after this if statement. So we're going to call this um, section of code 
this section of code like that is within this indent after the if block or if uh, statement like is um a code block right it's some like chunk of code that's only executed if the statement is true if my number is three We can also put an else. The else doesn't have any condition, right? So it's like, if this is true, and then the else is like a otherwise. So if my number is not equal to three in this scenario, then I will say no. Now, if I change my number, then even though it's the same chunk of code, it does something different depending on just one value that I changed. Can you explain again? I mean, people might have caught it, but I often run the cell by clicking the run button, but you're using some keyboard commands. Can you just review that again, just in case someone else missed it too? Oh, so, yeah, that was out of habit. So um, you can press shift enter to run a cell, or you can click the run button. Yeah, so that's just um, inside of Jupyter Notebook. If you look at help, um, there's tons of keyboard shortcuts you can actually look at. So it might be a little overwhelming to look at all of them at once, but people who use Jupyter Notebook a lot are definitely familiar with them. You can add a little note here. So use shift plus enter to run a cell, to run the currently selected cell. All right. Um, with this, we can make even a little guessing game. So let's create a second variable, actual number. Well, that's our, let's call it like secret number. I mean, it's not so secret because we're setting it, but Let's say we have some secret number. And then um, if the person guesses are the secret number, so if um, I'm going to rename my number to be the guess number. So if the guess number is equal equivalent to the secret number, Then we can say, you guess the number. Otherwise, we can say, nope. Try again. So that the person knows what to do, we can also print out the statement before that says, um, guess the number from. One to 10. So right now our guess number is always one, but um, what if we can actually have someone type in, um, like type in a number. So instead of guess number always equal to one, We can set guest number equal to not a number that we choose, but a number that we get from the input. Mm -hmm. So now um, Jupyter Nova creates this little input box that we can type in a number. And then notice how the code stopped right there. So Python will read code from top to bottom, left to right. So as soon as it reaches um, input, it creates this text box and it waits, right? Because um, Python can't do anything with a guess number until we actually get the input. So it's stopped right here, right? It didn't print out, um, you guessed the secret number or no try again. And then as soon as we finish typing, it continues with the rest of the code. 
Now, you might notice something a little unexpected, which is when we guess the secret number five, it says no, try again. Wait, but I mean, we know the secret number because we wrote this code, of course. Um, but like, why? It's something very tricky. And this has to do with um, data types. So you have to be very aware of the data types, which we said we have so far, numbers, strings, and Booleans. So we type in the number five. We're also able to type in text, which is not actually a number, but our code runs anyway. So that should give you a hint that the when we do get the user input, this is getting not a number, but it's getting whatever they type. And whatever they type, that's going to be a sequence of characters, which is a string. So if we were to inspect this a little, um, we can use more print statements in order to you know, figure out as programmer, programmers, like, okay, what is really happening to the code? So I'm going to, right after I get my input, just to, just to test, I'm going to print out the type of my guess number. And as I suspected, this is a type of string. And I'm just going to test in another box. If I check whether the number five is equivalent to a string five, this is false. So this is what I mean by, um, again, like it, it can be very tricky or sometimes frustrating when it seems it seems like you know it seems like all our logic is correct, but like something's not working. Our program like Python doesn't seem to understand. Well, you have to be Python takes things very literally, and you have to be aware of you know the data types, like what you are putting in, what you are getting out, and um, this uh, technique of just um, printing out what you think might be the problem can give you insight of how you can fix the issue that you're having. Okay, so how would we fix this um, issue? So um, does anyone have any ideas like what they would do so that, um, you know, we, we want to be able to compare. Um, right now, our guess number is a string and we need to compare that to a number. So what can we do in order to make it so that we would get true? Yeah, remove the quotes. So by, by removing the quotes, you know, we're turning the string into a number. So if I run the cell, yeah, um, thank you, Chloe. So now if I remove the quotes and I run the cell, then yes, indeed, five is equivalent to five. But now, if I look back at my guess the number code, like, but I don't have quotes around guess number, right? So like, there's no, there's no quotes I can delete here, but I do know that I want to be able to convert a, a string into a number. Okay. And then, I mean, I happen to know because I'm more fluent in Python, right? I've been speaking Python for a while. But like, let's say you don't know, like, okay, how do I convert a number into a string? And I shall give you insight into the life of a programmer. Because again, you have a very clear idea of what you need, but you don't know the exact, like, I, would, I call it, like, it's like vocab, right? Um, you don't know, like, exactly what to type in this scenario. So let's um, look it up. I'm going to literally just Google search. We're actually just going to Google search like um, Python convert string 
to a number. And then, okay, I've got lots of results. Um, sometimes it can be really overwhelming to, to parse the results, right? Because, um, you know, you have like so many different tutorials, options, whatever. Um, and this is where people usually get stuck, right? Like, yeah, people say Google it, but then like actually Googling itself because like the problem is, is not like where is the information or like, but there's like too much information, right? Um, this is just a skill that you'll pick up, you know, as you do this more. But here, it looks like this uh, first result gives us a good example. Um, even though like the article is really long, we just keep scrolling down and find what we need. Okay, and they say, okay, we can do something like this, where we have um, int, and then parentheses, and then in whatever string we're trying to convert. Okay, they have like, you know, they have different examples here too. So their use, their use case is different. So we don't necessarily want to like copy paste all our code, right? But you can look at how they're using it. Oh man, this is really long. So here, yeah, actually it's, a, it's similar, right? Instead of getting like a random number or a guest number, they're getting um, the user's like birth year, right? They're using the input function and then they convert it. They use the variable name and they have the int parentheses around the variable and that converts it into an actual number. Right, so um, try to avoid copy paste because when you copy paste, like usually, like you know, they're doing something else. Like their purpose is different. Um, but what you should do is try to read their code. Right, a lot of um, learning how to write code is also learning how to read code. Okay, so here. Um, I have my guest number equals input. And then I'm going to now change my guest number to be the integer version of whatever it used to be. So it used to be a string, but I am now going to change it so that is it is now a number. I'm printing out the type of guest number and now it should say integer. And now it's happy. It says, I can guess the secret number. Great. Um, Justice, you said, for some reason, my codes aren't creating an output anymore. So when you click run, it's um, not showing anything? Yes, it's just creating a new cell now. Hmm. You're also not getting any error. I have not had that happen. It looks like when the cell is empty, it does that where it just creates the cell. Um, are you printing? So I think like around here is when um, it stopped working, but like even oh. for this, when I hit run, it just does that oh. now. Okay. Um, these, so this is, this is not with Python. This is with Jupyter Notebook. Do you see, um, okay. What uh, I see is like, there's like the little asterisk, right? That means it's still loading. Oh. Yeah. So that's why it seems like it's not giving any output because it's like still like calculating, calculating. Um, it really, it should not be doing that. <laughs> okay. Well, at least I know like what the problem is now. That's fine. I'll just um, follow along. Trinity, can you explain about restarting the kernel? Okay. So um, on the top row, there's a button, uh, kernel. And we can um, yeah, click that. Or it should, should drop down. And you can, um, let's do a restart and run all. 
To explain a little bit about what the kernel is, um, so Jupyter Notebook is not Python. Jupyter Notebook is an interface on top of Python. It's a way to interact with, with Python. And so what the kernel is, the kernel is like the version or like the environment of Python that we are using, right? So um, in fact, when we first created our new um, Jupyter Notebook, we had a bunch of different options. There were different kinds of Python kernels we can choose from, um, Python 3.8, Python 3.8 with like some other module included, right? So those are all different kinds of uh, kernels that are available on this machine. So we chose like the basic uh, Python 3.8 one. Um, okay, so we just restarted the kernel and then reran all of the cells. Oh, okay, it's um it's still loading because you need to type in the the number right because um the code will stop at the input box and so if you never type in any input it's never going to stop okay um so i'll just put in like a one yeah um, okay now press the stop button to like forcibly stop it and then click on the stop button will only stop the current cell okay and then let's click on Click on this cell and then click run. Okay, and then now we get the text box and then now you can type something. Oh, after you type, you want to press enter. Yeah. So we're, okay. we're back, we're back. Awesome, mm -hmm. everything is running now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I should have uh, clarified that. So in the input box, uh, once you want to like you know, um, this is the input you want to give, you're done, you press um, the return or the enter key. Okay, this is very cool. Um, now, remember this uh, print um, type guess number? Like that was, that was for, you know, not, I didn't, I don't want that for like the end user, right? That's just um, so that me as a programmer could figure out what's happening. But since I don't actually want it to say this every time, I'm going to comment this. Remember, anything we put the hashtag in our pound symbol in front, it's um, Python's going to ignore. So now, if I do it again, you know, it doesn't show the type. Also, as programmers, you should always be very, very robust, right? Especially if, you know, there's going to be someone else you know, typing, you know, in this case, a random number at the end um, into your application. Like, you never know what the pesky user is going to do. Um, so, you know, you're allowed to type in, like, text into this box. And so what if, I know we told them to I guess a number from 1 to 10, but what if we don't type a number from 1 to 10? Right? No, no. Even though... Even though, like, you know, if we follow directions, our program works properly. If we don't, if there wasn't this big error. Now, if, um, again, like I guess errors aren't a big deal for us as developers, but, you know, depending on your purpose, you know, having an error also, I mean, it does mean that, like, let's say um, this was like an actual application that we've, like entire application we've created, you know, it's like, oh, look at my like really cool game, right? Um, and then like, if you were to type that, the app would just like crash, it would crash and like die, right? And like, well, that's not a very good uh, thing for the app to do. So in order to kind of prevent um, any possible avenues of error, we can make sure or like um, validate the user input by adding additional layers of logic to like make sure like what they typed was is indeed a number. I'm gonna, I might kind of like leave that as a challenge for you because I do want to cover some other topics. But yeah, if you would like, um, try to add more logic. 
to um, validate user inputs. Make sure that the guest number is indeed a number in one to 10. All right. Um, now the second thing I want to introduce is um, loops. So computers are very good at doing, you know, large amounts of calculations. And, um, you know, if we ever want to do like data analysis and like, you know, work with, work with um, large amounts of values, um, it's typical that we store them or, you know, to do that repeated calculations, we have to do something repetitive. We have to repeat something over and over again. So that's where um, loops come in. We have two different kinds of loops. Um, first, we have a while loop. It's very similar to the if statement, right? So you have, um, for if statement, you have if, and then some sort of ex uh, expression that evaluates to true or false, right? If it's raining outside. Same for while. You can do it while it is raining outside. Maybe like, you know, have a cup of hot, hot chocolate, right? With some expressions of either true or false. So in fact, um, I'm going to make a variable called um, the in user input. And that's just going to be um, empty text for now. I'm going to say while user input is not equal to what? And then um, Okay, so this is just um, preliminary codes because I want to sh uh, test or show you something. So in this program, you know, I'm going to write a program where the, the user can type in like multiple different commands maybe. And then um, when they type quit, I want it to exit out the while loop. So again, the while loop is going to keep repeating until some sort of condition is met. So again, while user input is not quit, it's going to keep printing out. In this case, um, we haven't quit yet. Now, if I ran this the way it is right now, first, let's think about what would happen um, before we run the code. Remember, we should always know what the code is doing even before we run it or at least have some sort of expectation. Okay, so I say user input is equal to just empty string. Now, while user input is not equal to quit, I print not quit yet. So I'm gonna, my expectation is gonna print not quit yet. And then it's gonna do that again. So it checks the condition again. Okay, is the user input equivalent to quit? No. Right, so this statement is true, and then it's going to print again. We have not quit yet. And then it loops again. We check the condition. Is this uh, true or false? Is this still true? Because we haven't changed, we don't change user input as this program. So this ends up becoming a loop that goes on forever. So if I, I'm going to run this, I do not run it on your computer because this will happen. I have this going on forever. And very soon, see if I can, no, it, the, the kernel, it doesn't show the memory of the kernel, but um, this is very bad for the computer because you're telling it to do an infinite amount of work, which it can't realistically do. Um, and you know, the whole screen freezes and like your application like crashes or stops responding. Yeah, I'm gonna have to interrupt this. I'm surprised it didn't run out of memory. 
sometimes um, if you have something like this, um, the kernel will forcibly shut down because like, again, the computer doesn't have unlimited resources. It has a set amount of RAM. Like some of your computers might have like eight gigabytes or 16 gigabytes of RAM. If you have a really good one, maybe 32. Um, but yeah, it, it has to stop at some point. <laughs> So with a while loop, you have to be very careful and make sure that it does stop at some point. In our case, in order to stop it, we have to make sure we actually change user input. In this case, user input is going to be whatever they type. Um, Inside of the parentheses of the input function, we can type in a prompt that we want to show to the user. And say like, please input any command with All right, so now, now that we're changing user input, I run this, um, this please type input a command. It's, I, you know, I do something and it keeps repeating. I mean, technically if I, if I never type in quit, it's never gonna stop. But as soon as I do type in quit, and there's no longer a text box and it's done. So now if we use our, um, this while loop, you know, this is a, uh, we can use this for a program, like a command program where we can like give it different commands and it'll like do, uh, make different calculations and things. Um, we could use that in conjunction with like if and else statements. So that like, if they type, um, if they type guessing game, then we can show them the guessing game. Or if they type in like, you know, um, calculate my taxes, like, I don't know, you can make any kind of program. You can do, like I said, a data analysis, right? You can have a program where you can type in different things and you can do different things depending on what you type and make all those calculations and whatnot. And again, this is really the power of programming. Just with these very simple things, um, we have different data types, the raw values that we can work with. Um, we have conditionals, so like the if and the else. And we have um, repetition or loops. And you can do just with those three things pretty much anything. You can also imagine with a while loop, um, Instead of using user input, um, we can make a program that counts up from one through a hundred. Let's say, let's say um, my counter is starts at one. I say while my counter is less than or equal to one hundred. I can print counter. And again, be very careful with while loops because if we wanted to stop at some point, we should change the variable in our condition. Right. In this case, if I wanted to go up from one to a hundred, every time I repeat, I'm going to change counter. So counter is now equal to um, whatever it used to be plus one. So then this will just um, print out all the numbers from one through a hundred. How about if I only wanted to um, print out prime numbers from one through a hundred? That'll be an interesting challenge. So you think about um, the definition of prime numbers and um, how you might make a 
another if condition. Maybe um, we only do this print if um, the, num the current counter is a prime number. And then you would have to come up with um, the logic to be able to tell by the definition of a prime number whether it is prime. Um, I'm going to do a simple example for even numbers. So if, only if the counter is even. I know if the counter is even if, by the definition of an even number, if I divide it by two, then I get no remainder. Um, quick thing. I know we there's a plus minus times divide um, in Python. There's also a uh, modulus operator. You may or may not have heard of it before, but the, this uh, operator is called modulo. is the remainder after you divide. So um, we know that five divided by two is 2.5. Five modulo two will give you one. Okay, so again with our um, even number example, If the counter modulo two, so the remainder after you divide by two is nothing, then only then will we print the counter. So I would put this print statement um, to be inside of the if. By inside, I mean this um, indentation. Yes, so modulo, again, once more, is the remainder after you divide. So 5 divided by 2, um, the whole number part is 2. And then we have like a remainder of 1. Yeah, when we think about remainder, so think about like um, fifth grade math, long division. So we have the number 5. We're dividing it by 2. You would say two. You have um, one left over. Now, uh, we as big boys and big girls know that um, we can put a decimal point zero and keep going. But um, for this um, modulo operation, we're only dealing with integer numbers. So we're not going to go into the decimal area. We would take this, um, now we call it a remainder of one. You know, one is not divisible by two. And so we say that um, five modulo two is one. Okay, I'm going to leave this as another challenge. This is, a, this will require, um, I mean, your math knowledge of primes and may include some extra operations to do this. Um, but how maybe like, yeah, this is a big challenge and you can ask me questions to show only prime numbers. Oh wait, I need to run this cell. But if I run this cell, you can see it only prints it out if um, it is divisible or if the number is even. I just want to close with like a note. Um, so we we have now just went through all the basics. These these um, things are the fundamentals of Python. And with these building blocks, you can pretty much write anything. Now, you can write anything and everything, but should you? <laughs> because um, coding is very, it's time intensive and there is a world out there with many, many other programmers and 
The programming world, especially with Python, is really nice because you have a community. So I strongly encourage you to use this community that we have with Min Kern and me as a resource. And also, um, like I showed earlier, like there is so, so much information out there that you can use if you're able to parse it. And that um, like there's a um, much bigger world with within Python because you have different kinds of um, packages or libraries that um, other people have wrote that, you know, like you could start from scratch or you can start with like a framework of different tools, you know, have a bigger toolkit so that you're able to really do more. Um, I was thinking that um, maybe next time we could do more with like data analysis, you know, if we can arrange that, Tanya, um, if people are interested. So I would be going over um, now how to use a this uh, data analysis library called Pandas. Yeah, so just um, a note there, like we have all the basics. You really do have a, a toolkit to you know write any program possible. Um, but having more tools available to you will make that life much easier. <laughs> it's like it's kind of a thing where just um, programmers are lazy, right? <laughs> that's like that's like your um, as a programmer, that's like going to be your new foundational like a way of thinking. Um, if there already exists something that can do it for you, you're going to use that because <laughs> you can be more productive that way. Okay, I hope everyone enjoyed it.